Okay, so to begin, uh, we're fortunate today to have Wasim Bakker from Princeton University. Um, Wasim uh, did his PhD at Harvard where he did pioneering work on developing quantum gas microscopy and continued in that vein for his postdoc. And then now uh, he's an associate professor at Princeton studying fermionic quantum matter. Uh, he's been recognized for numerous awards, including an AFOSR YIP and a Packard Fellowship. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Wasim. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be giving the second uh, talk in this uh, series, and I'd like to uh, thank Adam, Monica, and Shimon for pulling this together. So I'm going to be talking about um, our experiments on uh, transport in hot Fermi Hubbard systems, and the title maybe is a bit provocative since I'm using hot. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as doing experiments on ultra cold matter, but of course these experiments are hot in units of an actual temperature of the system, the Fermi temperature. But nevertheless, what I hope to show you is that um, even at these hot temperatures, we can get some interesting physics. Okay, so uh, let me. Um, uh, so, so the overall goal here uh, for for this uh, field is to uh, shed light on strongly correlated materials, including uh, high temperature superconductors, and uh, these were of course discovered back in 1986, uh, a long time ago. Um, and um, since then, there's been a lot of theoretical activity in this field, but uh, we still don't understand much about the coup rates. So here's a quote from a, from a paper back from 1995. It says, uh, it seems that over 30,000 papers have been written in the field of high TC superconductivity since the fundamental discovery. Considering that, despite the enorm enormous effort, progress has been little, and the mean field expected information per paper is little over 30,000. Therefore, it is probably not worth to read papers and it might be even less reasonable to write them. But anyway, they decided to write this paper. So the theoretical situation is uh, yeah, still very poorly understood, but fortunately, um, the experiments have had a lot of data. And um, they, in condensed matter, people have brought a lot of tools to bear in this um, problem of uh, high TC. Um, I'd like to highlight two that are particularly relevant for the sorts of experiments um, for the sorts of experiments I'm doing. Those are ARPIS and uh, transport. So with transport measurements, the superconductivity was of course discovered uh, in the first place, but then even in the normal state, this transport um, revealed some surprises, namely the existence of this uh, strength level regime. And uh, ARPIS measurements, or short for angle resolve for emission spectroscopy experiments, those were used, for example, to reveal uh, the DOH symmetry of the superconducting gap, the existence of the pseudo gap, the existence of these Fermi arcs. So uh, what I'd like to emphasize in this talk is that we'd like to bring a similar variety of tools to bear on our cold atom systems, um, including quantum gas microscopy, transport, and ARPIS, and much more. Okay, so I'd like to pose here to uh, just uh, remember uh, my... Uh, late colleague, Phil Anderson, who just passed away um, two, two weeks, uh, less than two weeks ago. So uh, Phil, of course, was a giant in the field of high TC superconductivity. Um, he shortly, at one year after the initial uh, discovery, he wrote this wonderful science paper where he proposed um, to use the Hubbard model as a, a playground in which to explore uh, these high TC superconductors. So in his memoirs, he writes, uh, he was working closely with um, the Bell Labs group uh, on the experimental side. So the Bell Labs uh, group was able to show me quantitatively the structure of the superconducting material. And the particular material they were studying was this one shown in panel A. And uh, I began to realize that we were being presented with a perfect exemplar for a mathematical model of great historical importance, the Hubbard model. So that's what's seen in, uh, in this panel B of this figure here. Okay, so what is this Hubbard model that we can, uh, it's a model that we can realize naturally with cold atoms almost exactly. Um, it's a model that, uh, it's a single band model of fermions in a two dimensional optical lattice. And uh, we have two species of fermions in this lattice, which we call um, in analogy to the, the spin states of the electron spin up and spin down. And these fermions can tunnel between neighboring sites with a matrix element T. So that's this first element of the Hamiltonian, the first term in the Hamiltonian. And the other thing they can do is if two fermions of opposite spin land on the same site, they interact strongly with an interaction U. So we can um, realize this um, in cold atoms, as I said, with a lot of control over the parameters. We can control the interactions with Feshbach resonances. Uh, 
uh, the tunneling with the depth of the lattice. We can control the temperature with controlled heating, and we can control the doping of the system. So here, this is referring to the average number of particles per site, which we can obviously vary in these experiments. And the goal here is to sort as, as to, to explore as much as we can of the phase diagram of these uh, Hubbard systems. So, um, of course, there's been a lot of uh, progress uh, recently, experimental progress in this area due to the introduction of these wonderful tools, uh, these fermionic uh, quantum gas microscopes uh, in the last uh, few decades, uh, sorry, in, in the last few years. And, um, and so, uh, with, these, with these tools, we can uh, now go and probe the many body wave function down at the individual lattice site level. We can, uh, we can probe things like the, uh, the density or the spin and construct all sorts of spatial correlation functions, things like density density correlations or spin spin correlations in these systems. And uh, that's been explored now with, uh, with lithium gases and with potassium gases in these groups mentioned here. And uh, there's been already a lot of exciting developments, including the discovery, for example, of magnetic polarons in these systems uh, when you slightly dope away from half filling or strings in these systems. Um, okay, so my group has been focusing mostly on the more doped part of the phase diagram. Um, so here's a phase diagram of the, the cuprates. I can't show you a phase diagram of the Hubbard model because we don't know what the Hubbard uh, phase diagram looks like at low temperatures. It becomes very computationally expensive to calculate uh, this phase diagram. So uh, let me start first in the regime of uh, half filling. Uh, so that's when you have an average of uh, one fermion per site, and you can have a little bit of quantum fluctuations uh, on top of. Uh, sorry, yeah, you start in the uh, regime of uh, on average one fermion per site, and uh, if you if you're Working at strong uh, at temperatures which are um, you're working at strong interactions at temperatures that are below the interaction energy scale, then you are in what's known as uh, a Mott insulating regime when you're at half filling. So this is basically the strong interactions suppress the density fluctuations, and uh, you get almost exactly one atom per site up to a little bit of quantum fluctuations. So then when you cool the system further. Uh, then you have these super exchange processes that uh, lead to anti-ferromagnetic ordering in the system. Um, okay, so these phases, the Mott insulator and the anti-ferromagnet, we know exist in the Hubbard model from uh, various uh, numerical techniques like quantum Monte Carlo, which you can do at half filling in the Fermi Hubbard model um, without the uh, Fermi on sign problem. So uh, you can simulate things very accurately at half filling all the way to down to very low temperatures. You can see in the Monte Carlo, there's this anti-ferromagnet and this, um, and this Mott insulator. And so these phases provide good benchmarks for us um, for, um, for the quantum simulations we're doing with cold atoms and optical lattices to compare against those. And uh, indeed uh, the, that has been done uh, with these quantum gas microscope experiments. So now the more interesting part of the phase diagram is once you start to dope away from half filling, so you can imagine, say, say, taking away some particles from the from the lattice. So you're now uh, hole doping, and uh, what is observed in the cuprates is there's a very rich phase diagram. I'm showing here only a few of the phases that appear in this phase diagram. So at low temperatures, we have a D-wave uh, superconductor, um, but even in the normal state, there's some interesting physics. Once you go above Tc, uh, there is. Uh, a metal, but this metal has, for example, anomalous transport properties in this blue region that's called the strange metal regime that I'll be discussing more later. And then um, there is this characteristic temperature scale T star here, where um, you start to open up a gap in the spectral functions close to the Fermi energy, even before you enter into the superconducting phase. Uh, so, so there's a separation of Tc from T star. Uh, which is sort of unusual from the point of view of BCS superconductivity, where one sees that you only open up the gap once you enter into the superconductor. Okay, so um, yeah, so these, these parts of the phase diagram, you can't explore easily with quantum gas microscopy because the things characterizing these regimes or phases, these pseudo gaps and strange metal, aren't equal time correlation functions. You have to go and measure response functions. So for example, the resistivity in the strange metal, which is related to unequal time current correlation functions. Um, so we have to start to expand our toolkit beyond this microscopy to look at things like transport or ARPIS. Here, I wanna start by um, 
just flashing one quick slide about um, about our, our recent work on ARPIS and hybrid systems. So ARPIS is a technique that was introduced into uh, the cold atom field in uh, pioneering experiments from the group of Debbie Jin, where she used it to study unitary Fermi gases. And um, there she saw things like, she could extract the dispersion of the quasi particles, she saw the pseudo gap, and there were similar experiments in the group of Michael Cole with 2D gases. So uh, there's a very similar thing we can do with lattice systems, with lattice Hubbard systems, where um, you can um, study the BECS, BEC, BCS crossover inside the lattice. Uh, so this is as a function of the U over T, the ratio of interactions to tunneling. So basically weak interactions correspond to the BCS limit and strong interactions correspond to the BEC limit. And um, Yeah, so, so what, uh, what we can do this is, again, this radio frequency ARPIS, and uh, we can measure the occupied spectral function in these experiments. And the nice thing about the attractive Hubbard model is that it's a model which can be tackled with quantum Monte Carlo at any filling. There's no fermion sign problem at any filling. And so we, we collaborated with a group of Tom Devereaux at Stanford, and that's this um, QMC uh, data at the bottom. And you can see they agree very well with, uh, with the experimental data. So, so what you're seeing here is, these are the occupied spectral functions. The brighter means higher spectral weight. The blue dashed line is the chemical potential line. And so as you, um, the, the white line is basically non-interacting gas. So uh, as you go from weak interactions to strong interactions, at weak interactions, the gap is exponentially small in the VCS limits. So the spectral weight approaches the chemical potential line. But then as you start to increase the, the strength of the interactions, uh, you open up a larger and larger gap. And so you're going crossing over from a many body gap in, in sort of this intermediate regime, interaction regime to a two body gap in the strong interaction regime. So um, this, is, this was a good place to start benchmarking this, this ARPIS uh, in a lattice system. But of course, our goal is to now start tackling the more uh, the less well understood system, uh, namely the doped Mott insulator regime, uh, where there the spectral functions are harder to compute with quantum Monte Carlo. And um, things are looks promising because if you look at where we are in terms of the temperature in these cold atom systems, we're roughly like right now at 0.2 to 0.3 T, uh, where T is the tunneling. Uh, so here's a dynamical mean field theory calculation a phase diagram. Um, showing the temperature scale for the pseudo gap, that's this black line T star, um, that if you extrapolate to the limit of very low doping, that's uh, you know, roughly where the experiments are right now. So we're on the verge of starting to look at, uh, to see the pseudo gap opening. Uh, there's also other interesting things happening. For example, there's this change in the topology of the Fermi surface as you change the doping of the system. And this you can explore um, by uh, simply like integrating these spectral functions, you can get the, the momentum occupation so you can reconstruct the Fermi surface. So I think that there's gonna be some very exciting work to do there. Okay, so, but this talk is gonna be about transport. Uh, so I find this uh, interesting statistic uh, in a paper, it says 92.78% of all major discoveries in solid state physics have been made by measuring resistance. And I don't know how much I believe the statistics, uh, but it sounds like a good place to start. So we'd like to try to go and uh, measure the resistance in our system. And the, the question we're after here is, um, is there a, a strange metal in the Hubbard model? So we know there's a strange metal in the cuprates, in many other strongly correlated materials. Uh, does the Hubbard model have a strange metal? And that's a question which you would, it's, you would think that should have been answered a long time ago, you know, with the Hubbard model being a paradigm for these scoop rates, you might think people have computed the resistivity in the Hubbard model, but it turns out the calculations are incredibly computationally expensive. And so there wasn't any exact calculation before these experiments we did. So we, we went into this blind. And um, okay, so before I tell you about bad and strange metals, which is some of this confusing terminology people use in condensed matter, let me start first with what a good metal is. So a good metal is basically a metal where, um, where you have quasi particles and these quasi particles carry the various conserved quantities like charge or spin or energy. And um, you can think of them sort of as bouncing off each other every mean free path, which is what I'm denoting by L here. Uh, 
And this L can be related to a momentum relaxation rate through the, through the Fermi velocity. So this momentum relaxation rate, you can uh, use freshman physics to just relate it to, through the Ruda model, basically, the Ruda equation to a resistivity. Um, okay, so now you can intuitively set some various bounds on the transport in the system uh, from this quasi-particle picture. So if, if you have a system with quasi-particles and you think about the mean free path, it cannot get shorter than um, the interparticle spacing or let's say a lattice system, the lattice spacing. So there's a minimum mean free path. If you try to increase the temperature of the system, you expect the mean free path to get smaller and smaller, but eventually it has to saturate at say the interparticle spacing. So this would also correspond to a saturation of the resistivity. It's an upper bound in the resistivity. So as you start to increase the temperature of a quasi-particle system, the resistivity has to eventually saturate at some maximum resistivity. And that's what's indeed observed uh, in many systems. Okay, another thing we, we can conclude about um, quasi-particle systems is what happens at low temperatures. So at low temperatures, you can combine Fermi liquid theory and Boltzmann transport theory to make a prediction for how the resistivity should scale with temperature. And naturally the resistivity depends, how it scales depends on what the mechanism for the resistivity is. So it could be something like disorder, or it could be um, in a solid state system like disorder or phonons or um, interactions between the electrons. Now, fortunately our, in our cold atom systems, we don't have any disorder usually, unless you put it in in the lattice, you don't, have, um, you don't have these phonons because the lattice is rigid. So the only source of resistivity is the interactions. And the, this combination of Fermi liquid theory with the Boltzmann theory tells you that this resistivity scales quadratically with the temperature. Okay, so that defines a good metal. How does this contrast with a bad metal? So a bad metal is found in many uh, strongly correlated materials. Uh, here's an example from the group of Dimitri Basov at Columbia. So you can see, uh, this is basically the cuprate compound I showed earlier. Um, uh, if you look at the resistivity versus temperature, it's a straight line in the normal phase. So at this point it becomes superconducting and the resistivity drops to zero. But, but here it's a straight line over a very large uh, range of temperature all the way up to like roughly a thousand Kelvin. And furthermore, it also violates this um, Motiafi regal limit. So that's this green band here. And, and this is in contrast, say, with more like a good metal, which would saturate like this one here. So um, yeah, so you call it a bad metal if it violates the MIR limit and a strange metal in the cuprates when you have these uh, straight lines in the resistivity. So both of these things are things that are sort of inconsistent with this quasi-particle picture, unless uh, you have phonons, which would actually lead to a linear anti-resistivity. So uh, there are many reasons why people think in the cuprates, it's not phonons playing this role, but there are electronic interactions, but then how can electronic interactions lead to this linear anti-resistivity? So um, our approach is to tackle this through the Fermi-Hubbard model and see if we can get a line in the resistivity there. Of course, there's been a lot of previous work uh, measuring resistivity in cold atom systems. Um, it's too long of a list to mention, to, to put uh, here, and I'm probably missing a lot of people, but let me just highlight uh, the work from uh, ETH Zurich and Tilman Esslinger's group, and uh, it's very related to work to ours in lattice systems from uh, DeMar the DeMarco's group and from Joseph Iverson's group. Okay, so uh, it's challenging to measure the bulk resistivity in Hubbard systems, but um, our take on it is rather than try to measure the bulk resistivity, let's go and try to measure, uh, instead of this microscopic quantity, let's go measure a more microscopic quantity, namely the diffusivity of the system. And we have this wonderful relation in condensed matter, namely the Nernst-Einstein relation, that links the conductivity of the system, the inverse of the resistivity, to the diffusivity. Uh, so it's basically the conductivity is the diffusivity times this thermodynamic quantity, which is the compressibility. So compressibility is a quantity people in cold atoms have known how to measure for quite a while now. I'll, I'll show you our measurements later. Uh, that's not new. The new part is the diffusivity. That's a dynamical quantity that's hard to compute and hard to measure. And okay, so the first thing you might wanna do in the experiment is you saw the strange metal in the cuprates occurs at a specific range of densities. So you want to work in a narrow window of densities so we, we actually use our microscope to um, 
fix the density of our system. So usually you have these lattices, um, they have a, the gases are sitting in a harmonic confinement due to the Gaussian laser beams. But we can also project some extra light through the objective using that's shaped using a spatial light modulator and use it to get a flat density profile. So that's our starting point. And we're working in these experiments at a density of roughly 80% of the sites are full, corresponding to 20% hole doping. And we just chose that arbitrarily, but mostly kind of guided by where the cuprates um, are exhibiting this strange metal behavior. Okay, so now to measure the diffusivity, what we do is we add to this, um, to this um, flat density profile, we add a long wavelength uh, potential that's a sinusoidal. And so that gives us these, uh, basically this, we load adiabatically into this potential. So we end up with this charge density wave whose wavelength we can control in the system uh, using the spatial light modulator anywhere from two sides up to the full system size, which for us is um, the flat part of the system is about a uh, diameter of 30 sites corresponding to roughly a thousand atoms in this uh, circular region. Okay, so we can control the wavelength of this uh, charge density wave. And now what we do is we suddenly switch off the modulating potential, okay? So as you ex might expect, now you have this charge density free to move around. So the fermions are, can move and diffuse around in the lattice and very quickly the charge density wave disappears. So that's uh, what you see here in this picture. They disappear within a few hundred microseconds or corresponding to a few ton link times. Okay, so now by tracking the dynamics of what's happening here, we can go and um, extract the diffusivity. Okay, so the idea is we're gonna fit the amplitude of the modulations and uh, plot it versus time. This is all done in a strongly interacting system, U over T of about seven or eight, corresponding to the value in the group rates and a density uh, of, uh, or a doping of about 20%. So the first thing we see is that this, how this oscillations die out or how, these, um, how this charge density wave amplitude goes to zero uh, depends on the wavelength we, we, of the charge density wave. So if we work with a short wavelength, then we see something like this. So this is a wavelength of five sites. We see an underdamped oscillation of uh, the amplitude of this charge density wave. And uh, this is not what you expect from diffusion, right? Diffusion would say that you would get an exponentially decaying amplitude. Um, so this is more reminiscent of something like a sound wave where uh, like instead of maybe instead of switching off the potential, you could imagine like perturbing it with some potential and then you would get waves, uh, sound waves emitted from the perturbation, right? So that's something like damp sound here. Um, okay, so now if we go to a longer wavelength, uh, this is at 10 sites in green, you can see it becomes more damped at 15 sites, even more damped at 20 sites, completely damped. And at this point, the red curve, you might even start thinking about fitting this with an exponential decay. So that's more like diffusion at that point. So what we see is a crossover from sound to diffusion, okay? And these lines you're seeing here are coming from a simple model we cooked up, as simple as it can be. So we know that it's an interacting system. It's sufficiently long length scales. We can always describe it in terms of hydrodynamics. So the hydrodynamic model we have is these two equations. The first equation is just charge conservation. The second equation is an equation which is more phenomenological. So we say we want to reproduce uh, diffusion at long wavelengths. And the standard way to do that is Fick's law, which uh, says that the density gradients are what drive the currents and the proportionality constant is this particle diffusivity D, okay? Um, okay, great. But that will only give us the exponential decay at long wavelengths. How do we reproduce the behavior at short wavelengths? Well, then we have to say, well, the current cannot build up due to this charge density, uh, due to this charge density wave, this modulated density, the current cannot build up instantaneously in response to a density gradient. It has to build up over some time scale. And um, so there's gonna be some relaxation time scale or some corresponding current relaxation rate, which we denote gamma. So basically this equation says we approach the steady state at a rate gamma and once this rate of, once this time derivative goes to zero then we recover fixed law so the steady state is the diffusion uh, behavior uh, uh, sorry the, the current predicted by fixed law okay so 
So this combination of equations, these two equations are actually, when you combine them, they give you an equation for a harmonic oscillator. Okay, and not surprisingly, this will exhibit a crossover from um, under damped to over damped. So the damping rate in the oscillator is gamma and the frequency is K, the wave vector of this charge density wave multiplied by the speed of sound, which would be square root of gamma times D, okay? And so we're controlling the frequency of the oscillator with K, the charge density wave. And so we can control the Q factor and cross over from this, um, from this uh, under damped sound to, over, uh, to this sort of diffusive behavior. Okay, so basically the two parameters in the model are gamma and D, and we can fit all our data at different wavelengths with these two parameters. Um, and the fact that it fits is evidence that the hydrodynamics works because hydrodynamics is essentially constraining the K dependence. Okay, so now we can go and study how these quantities depend on temperature by doing a controlled heating of the system. And this is done over a very large range of temperatures. So starting from the lowest temperature here is 30% uh, of the tunneling. That's the lowest temperature we can reach so far. That corresponds to roughly about uh, 800 to 1000 kelvins in the coup rates. So that's kind of near the upper end of the data I showed you from uh, before in the, on these uh, uh, coup rate superconductors when they're measuring the strange metal behavior. And then on the other end, uh, 8T, that's an incredibly high temperature, tens of thousands of kelvins. So that's uh, the full bandwidth of our system. And that would, the recuperates would melt there. So this is not a physical regime they can explore in these uh, experiments. Um, okay, so what we see now is that the diffusivity as expected goes up when you lower the temperature and the current relaxation rate goes down. That's what you expect when you're cooling the system, the poly blocking starts to block, uh, close the scattering channels, so diffusivity goes up. Um, it does seem to saturate at uh, something similar to what you might expect, this Motiafi regal limit. Um, and um, okay, so the key thing here is we have a non-trivial temperature dependence of the diffusivity, which we can now go and combine with the compressibility to, to go and get the, the resistivity. Okay, so how do we get the compressibility? Um, the compressibility is uh, something that we were told how to measure a long time ago by Jason Ho. So if you just put the gas in a harmonic trap, then the local chemical potential varies and the density responds to that. So uh, you just take the derivative of the density profile and you get the compressibility. Okay, so that's these red points here. And fortunately, compressibility is something related to um, a static quantity. It's an equal time density correlations. We can compute those very well with quantum Monte Carlo. That's these green points here and they agree very well. So um, we see again a temperature dependent compressibility. Um, so now there are one, it's useful to consider two limits here. One limit is very low temperatures, which is where condensed matter experiments usually are. There the compressibility has saturated in their experiments. So any dependence of the resistivity comes purely from the diffusivity, okay? We're not in that regime. Um, there's also the opposite limit, which is at very, very, very high temperatures compared to 8T, this bandwidth. So that's a regime where one can do a high temperature expansion of the compressibility and you get that it behaves like one over T. And uh, David Hughes and others have argued that diffusivity has to saturate in that limit. And therefore you get a one over T dependence of the conductivity or a linear in temperature resistivity at high temperatures and that's well understood, okay? So we're kind of operating in neither of these regimes. We're in a regime where both compressibility and diffusivity are varying in a non-trivial way, okay? So that's what I'm gonna call the intermediate temperature regime. And what we see there is that um, the, when we take the resistivity, the multiply these two quantities and take the inverse, we get a beautiful straight line, okay? So that was a surprise. Um, it does violate the Motiafi regal limit, but that's less surprising because I told you the thermodynamics tells us that the compressibility has to vanish at very high temperatures. So in the Fermi Hubbard model, that's understood where that comes from, but it was surprising. And, um, and so we, uh, we worked with various uh, numerics group to see if we can reproduce that. Um, so these are calculations in blue from the group of Fury Co College doing finite temperature Lanshaw. So this is basically an exact diagonalization on four by four lattice sites, uh, which already takes a month to do. So it's already very computationally expensive uh, in the Fermi Hubbard model. And, um, and uh, that's without any free parameters fits very well to the data. That's an exact technique. Uh, 
Now you might wait, you run into finite size effects at low temperatures, you do, that happens roughly about a t equals one, so three times experimental temperature, but over the range where we can compare, it looks pretty good. Um, another popular technique that's used to often is dynamical mean field theory. So here we collaborated with Vandermeer Tremblay, and that doesn't agree so well. So that's only is expected to agree in the limit of infinite dimensions. Um, and uh, they have some theories regarding vertex corrections, why, um, why that might uh, be deviating from these exact uh, calculations. And after the experiment, uh, after this experiment we did a few months later, there was the group of Tom Devereaux at Stanford. They used Pona Monte Carlo, the gold standard for tackling the Hubbard model uh, to do these calculations uh, on the resistivity. And th they could only be done last year because the amount of computational power you need to throw at the problem uh, you need to get very small error bars on the imaginary time current correlations to do analytic continuation to real time to get the conductivity. And that requires very small error bars. So it's only recently that they could do these calculations and they again see a straight line at the doping we're working at. Okay, so um, that's the end of my story on charge um, transport. I'm gonna switch to heat transport, but before that I'll stop and take any questions. Um. Okay, so I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions via the Q&A uh, window, or if you're watching on YouTube via the comments. Um, and so we do have a couple of questions. So uh, James Dragon asked, uh, can you explain why the Hubbard model is computationally expensive at low temperatures? Is it physics reasons or computer science reasons? That's outside of my, what would I know? So, I mean, like this is the usual, uh, I mean, it's a quantum system, it's Hilbert space blows up exponentially. So if you're trying to do like these exact diagonalization uh, calculations, uh, like this, the finite temperature loss, it's obvious they are like the Hilbert space goes like four to the N. And so it's the Hilbert space just gets too big and the memory and um, uh, time requirements become very expensive. Now, I think with quantum Monte Carlo, they do smarter tricks, but still they run into this so-called fermion time problem where uh, as you, when this side problem becomes severe, you have to increasingly average more and more, um, uh, go to average a lot of simulations to get this spine problem to go away. And uh, so you run into a problem there, but I don't know enough about the details of the numerics to tell you exactly why with QMC, that's the problem. Um, okay, so Aruku Senu asked, uh, is the cuprate strange metal feature from hydrodynamic effect of electrons as you're simulating now, or do you know the evidence that it is dominant from previous studies? I, it's very, with the cuprate, it's not a close story. I, I don't know the answer to that. It's, uh, uh, I, mean, I, I was in a talk last year where they're still arguing whether it's coming from phonons or electronic contributions. Mm -hmm. um, and Thomas Killian asks, um, when comparing the atomic gas microscope results to results from materials, how important is it that the atomic gas is 2D while the materials are 3D? I mean, there. So the the the, the cuprates. It is basically you can approximate them as two D layers, which are which have some weak interlayer coupling. Um, probably the interlayer coupling helps in improving the TC a little bit, um, but but mostly people start like to cut to the calculations on two D models. Uh, so that's what we're simulating. Um, I mean, there are certain features like that. For example, the antiferromagnet at half filling in 2D, you wouldn't expect uh, an anti a phase transition to an antiferromagnet because of the merman wagner theorem. But then like in a real material, you do have a transition probably because of the interlayer coupling. Um, so, so it doesn't reproduce everything, but ultimately we're not simulating the cuprates, we're simulating the fermi hubbard model. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions we have for now. So I think you can move on and we'll, ask, we'll be taking more questions at the end of the talk. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, there is one more. Um, we'll do one more and then we'll move on. So Kevin Rue asks, um, have you studied uh, up to which interaction strength does the bad metal phase persist on BEC and BCS side? Um, okay, so I think there's some confusion here in the question. So the uh, the the BEC and BCS story is on the attractive Hubbard model. And this strange metal I'm talking about, the repulsive Hubbard, a doped repulsive Hubbard model. And uh, in the answer, okay, so we were working in repulsive interactions, not attractive. So BEC, BCS, CS crossover is not relevant, but um, uh, we haven't actually varied the doping or the interaction 
in the system. The only knob we vary is the temperature. There are these measurements already take a lot of time. <laughs> it's hard to get a lot of uh, uh, parameters. OK, thanks. So I think we'll move on now, and we'll, we'll save uh, okay. any remaining questions for the end of the talk. Yeah. So OK, so the next part of this talk, I want to switch to um, something I'm going to call heat transport in disguise. OK, so we're going to be looking at charge transport, but you'll see that ultimately the transport, the, 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 the important part of the transport is the heat transport in the story. So this is something we stumbled on by accident. Um, so uh, the motivation for this work, uh, well, before, OK, so the setup is pretty simple. So we're going to look at um, the Hubbard system, the exact same sort of system we looked at before, but we're just going to go and tilt it. OK, and we're going to put it in a very large tilt. And you already know what happens when the system is not interacting. So when you have non-interacting fermions, um, you get um, uh, block oscillations, right? So you, you at sufficiently large tilt, um, the amplitude of these oscillations is very small, and you can think of the system as being start localized. Okay. So at the beginning of uh, last year, there came out a, a couple of papers that we're predicting a phenomenon of many body localization in clean tilted systems. The emphasis here is on the word clean, because usually you associate many body localization with disorder. And so the typical MBL, you talk about Anderson localization in the single particle limit, and then you introduce the interactions. And as you in increase the interactions, the localization persists over some range of interactions. Um, OK, so in these papers, they were claiming in the tilted system, they did some numerics in a 1D system. It looked very similar. Um, they, they looked at things like level statistics and so on. And again, they saw some localization that persists in the presence of interaction on top of the stark localization. And so they started calling it MBL. That was uh, when we jumped in with the experiments. We decided this looked like a straightforward experiment to do. So let's try it out, see if we can see localization in tilted systems. Um, unfortunately, shortly after we jumped in with the experiments, uh, there was some more theory work. And what that theory work said was um, actually these previous numerics experiments um, were done starting from a very particular set of states, which um, were localized. But if you consider um, a more generic state, generic state with thermalize. And their interpretation of what was going on was that uh, there were uh, some conservation laws in, the, in this problem. Uh, namely charge conservation, which we already had. And then we're adding, because of this tilt, some uh, energy constraints, which lead to effective dipole conservation. And what this led to was a fracturing of the Hilbert space uh, into many sectors in the Hamiltonian. So, And then it, often you would get these very small sectors, which would fail to thermalize under their dynamics. Um, OK, so basically, this is a story very similar to Misha Lukin's uh, quantum scars. Uh, with Rydberg Adams, except here, instead of a few localized states, you have a few quantum scars. Here, you have an exponentially large number of quantum scars in, this, in the Hubert space. OK, so that's um, something we're interested in. But uh, we're still, what we've, what we've focused on in this work is thermalizing behavior. Um, OK, so the, the experiment here is not in 1D like these theory papers. It's in 2D, just easier for us to do. Um, and um, the, the tilt uh, in these experiments is created by putting the cloud in a Gaussian laser beam with a large waist. And so the cloud is sitting on the slope here. Uh, so you experience an approximately linear potential. And um, for some reason, my students uh, decided they wanted to align the lattice, um, the, the tilt very carefully along one of the lattice axes. Okay, that was the setup they chose. And now, if you think about it, that's not a good candidate for seeing localization because now the fermions are free to hop along the direction orthogonal to the gradient. Um, and what that means is um, you have a large reservoir in that direction which can cause thermalization. OK, um, Okay, but we did the experiment anyway. So we have a large tilt. And now because the fermions are free to hop in this, so the tilt is along this direction, and the fermions are free to hop in this direction. So to avoid the gas so expanding that direction, we add some hard walls using our spatial light modulator. And uh, we watch the dynamics, again, of a charge density wave that's prepared the same way as before. OK, so what we see is the, well, OK, so the first time we did this, we did this uh, with a rather long wavelength modulation. And to our surprise, 
this modulation stuck for a very, very long time. And we thought, wow, we're seeing localization. Um, but then when we started varying the wavelength, we saw that at shorter wavelengths, it was decaying. So uh, it was thermalizing. And so what, what we concluded was we were seeing some very slow thermalization behavior. And the question was, what is causing the slow thermalization behavior? Okay, so here's some quantitative data. Um, okay, so this data here on the left panel, that's uh, looking at zero tilt. So the tilt is denoted by this F, so that's the energy bias between neighboring sites in units of the tunneling. And so here we're working at zero tilt and a moderate interaction U over T4. Okay, so uh, we find that uh, we're working at long wavelengths here in the range of 12 to 24 sites. And there things look, uh, this is the same experiment as before essentially. The, you get diffusive behavior, uh, you have exponential decay uh, with some time scale tau. And this time scale uh, behaves quadratically with the wavelength, which is exactly what you expect from diffusion. That the time scale goes like distance squared, okay? Good, so this we understand. Now let's go to a very strong tilt, F over T2, okay? That's pretty strong. And what we see there is the dynamics gets much, much slower still looks like exponentials, we can fit good exponentials. And um, the time scale now goes like the wavelength to the fourth power, okay? So that's very unusual. That's uh, subdiffusive dynamics. So what can goes to that? What can lead that? You know, diffusive dynamics is such a generic feature of, uh, of uh, most systems. What, what, how can we go away from this diffusion? And uh, so, so here's now looking at things a bit more quantitatively as you, um, vary the gradient, we've uh, looked at this relaxation time versus uh, the wavelength to some, put it versus a wavelength to the, some power alpha. And this exponent alpha goes from two in the limit of no gradient to four in the limit of very large gradient. And the crossover happens roughly at F over T roughly one, okay? Okay, so uh, again, we're gonna use hydrodynamics to understand what's happening. Um, and I'm gonna break this into multiple steps for you. So you see that the typical time scales here we're talking are like 600 ton length times. So, so the first step actually happens over a very short time scale. That happens roughly on the 10 uh, ton length time time scale. And so this is what I'm gonna call the fast initial dynamics. And really when I'm talking about the exponentials, I'm talking about the long time behavior. So, um, Okay, so you would expect if you have a system in a gradient, your first guess might be it's gonna fall down the, the hill, right? Um, well, turns out that intuition is not completely right in this system because it's a closed quantum system. So if you're gonna fall down the hill, you have to lose potential energy and that potential energy has to go somewhere, right? We don't have any friction in these systems. So where does it go? Uh, it goes into uh, heating up the internal energy, uh, uh, increasing the internal energy of the system and um, there's a bound to how much you can heat up the system. So our tilts are small, uh, the bias between neighboring sites is small compared to the band gap. So higher bands are not included in this problem. We've verified that experimentally using band mapping. So we, we should really think in terms of a, a single band system. And in a single band system, uh, if you're trying to maximize the, the entropy of the system, you just heat it up to infinite temperature. And there, this infinite temperature state has some uh, energy associated with it, which is on the order of the microscopic energy scales, U or T, okay? And so you can at most put something on the order of U or T per particle into the infinite temperature state, which you would get to by sliding down the hill. Um, okay, but then our gradients are also on the order of uh, this U over T. Uh, the difference between the energies on uh, on a neighboring sites. So, so what that means is that you're going to slip on the order of one site, and you already kind of have taken all the potential energy you can and dumped it into into this internal state, and you can't heat up the system anymore because it's reached about infinite temperature within the single band model. So that's what we need to see in the experiment. If we look at the phase of this charge density wave we start out with, it uh, it slips on the order of one site, regardless of the parameters. Um, and that happens very quickly on the order of uh, 10 ton length times. Okay, so that's the first piece of the puzzle. And now we've heated up close to infinite temperature. So the more natural thing to be talking about is uh, the inverse temperature beta, okay? Uh, so we're, we're close to beta equals zero at that point. 
So that's why I called my talk hot. We're really hot here where it's infinite temperature. Okay, so now, now we can think about the next step in the relaxation. We need to relax this charge density wave, okay? Um, that we started out with. So this is this experimentally measured charge density wave in green, that's a single component density. So the average density here is maybe like point, somewhere in 0.7 or so uh, for the two components. And um, okay, so if you look at this part of the density here, okay, so the key thing here first is where fr the fermions are free to tunnel in the direction orthogonal to the gradient, which means they can thermalize in that direction. So very quickly you'll establish local equilibrium and you can start talking about the local temperature and the local density in the system. And that's what allows you to move on to now using hydrodynamics to describe the system. Um, so if you look at this chunk of the density here, where uh, you have a positive slope of the density, then that means you have more atoms up the hill than down the hill. So this is a situation where you have like some sort of like, like a population inversion. So you would describe this uh, with a negative temperature, okay? So uh, this part corresponds to negative temperature here. So this orange is the beta. This would correspond to negative temperature. And then this part here um, is positive temperature because you have more atoms down the hill than up the hill, okay? So essentially this beta is oscillating around zero from being slightly negative to slightly positive. And, uh, and this, so it's something we couldn't have even imagined how to engineer if you wanted to start with by creating a, a beta wave. We, we call this thing a beta wave. You, you, it's hard to imagine how to create, but here the system creates it automatically by just slipping down the hill, the density gets converted to this beta oscillation. Um, and so, so the beta is proportional to the gradients of the density essentially. And from that point on, the density and the temperature are locked to each other. Um, once we figured out that that's what's happening in theoretically, we could go and measure this in the experiment because with a microscope, you have access to the local density and the local Dublon density, two quantities. And if you take the ratio of those in a high temperature expansion, you can get uh, the, the beta of the system. And we are, we're at infinite temperature, so definitely high temperature expansion works here. Okay, so we get this, uh, this beta wave, which we measure from the experiment and it matches very well with our expectations. So at that point, you have uh, a varying energy density, which means you're gonna start creating energy or heat currents, okay, in order to equilibrate the system. Okay, so uh, this point, we have to write uh, a relation like this, where you have heat diffusion because of these gradients of the energy density. So the energy current is proportional to the gradient of the energy densities with the proportionality constant being the thermal diffusivity. So this is my almost second to last slide and it's gonna be a bit heavy on the equations, but uh, I need that to, to show you how we can get this lambda to the four behavior. Okay, so we have the heat currents and uh, here basically I'm defining the local energy density E as being in the infinite temperature limit being um, the, uh, the infinite temperature state as having a zero local energy density, that's just cho choosing my zero energy reference. And um, we can relate it with a high temperature expansion. It's basically, sh you get the fact that this E is proportional to beta uh, with some coefficients in front, which you can get from the thermodynamics of the Hubbard model. So you, you can do this high temperature expansion, that's possible. And so E is proportional to beta and the heat currents are proportional to gradients of beta, okay? Good. So now the last thing we need from the hydrodynamics is the conservation laws, the energy conservation and the number conservation. So here's the energy conservation equation. We say that the rate of change of the local energy density is given by uh, these two terms. One is heat diffusion, divergence of heat from that point. Or you can have dual heating. So you have, if you have an actual number current, not a heat current, but a number current, then uh, that um, will uh, basically, as you move down the gradient, you'll convert this potential energy into heat. And uh, so you get some sort of IV term here, some dual heating, okay? You're adding heat to the system because of these atoms rolling down the hill, okay? So, so that's the energy conservation equation. And you can ask, what is it that characterizes the strong tilt regime? So in the strong tilt regime, the, the density and the uh, is, changing very slowly as we saw. So n dot is approximately zero. And as you saw, n and e are related. So, so e dot is also changing very slowly. So we can approximate this part, this e dot to be zero. And then you set the two terms here equal to each other, okay? 
So basically the particle current Jn, this one is proportional to the divergence of the heat current. So that's the first derivative of the heat current. And then the heat current itself was a gradient of beta. So that's the second derivative of beta. But the beta, if you look back to the equation I wrote down here, the beta is proportional to a gradient of the density. Okay, so now I put beta as gradient density, that gives me a third derivative of the density, okay? Okay, finally, we need the number conservation equation. That's this equation here. If you plug in now for the particle current, that's a derivative, uh, the n dot is a derivative of Jn, which is a, a, a fourth derivative now of n, okay? So you see, you get something like the diffusion equation would be n dot is the second derivative of n. This is n dot is the fourth derivative of n. And so now if, uh, you get something where the time scale is set, uh, it was proportional to lambda to the four, that's this four here. And it's only controlled by the thermal diffusivity, okay? The number diffusivity doesn't appear in here. Uh, this is only true in the limit of very large gradients, okay? So we can do essentially a one parameter fit here and get the thermal diffusivity. And that's what you're seeing here. So that's the thermal diffusivity in the infinite temperature Hubbard, uh, in the, at infinite temperature in the single band Hubbard model as a function of the gradient. Okay, so um, I think it's pretty cool. We are able to access these dynamical quantities at, uh, at these infinite temperatures. And these are not a trivial at all to calculate. So here, I, we actually tried to get in touch with theorists to try to put some theory in front of, uh, on top of this data and doesn't, it's, it's very hard to do. Um, okay, so um, moving, looking just uh, looking ahead at what we can do with the system. So the next thing we'd like to try now is to go away from this thermalizing regime. So we'd like to start exploring this fractonic physics I mentioned earlier. So you can do that in several ways. You can work in a 1D system. So if you just decouple the chains, for example, or you could go to a 2D system where you now just simply tilt away from uh, the, the, the gradient being aligned with the lattice axis. If you, if you go along, say, something um, not a diagonal, but somewhere in between, then you expect uh, it's some arbitrary angle uh, to, uh, to just get like this uh, fractonic behavior. And, um, and so there you would expect if you start in particular states, uh, you would get uh, these quantum scars, which would live for a very long time. Uh, in principle, they're, they're completely localized. Okay, so with that, I wanna conclude and uh, thank the people who did this work, uh, Peter Brown and Deva and Mitra, uh, who spearheaded the strange metal work, uh, and Elmer Guardado Sanchez and Benjamin Spar, who worked on this uh, heat transport story. And we had a lot of help from um, uh, theory at Princeton from the group of David Hughes and uh, his student, Alan Morningstar, and um, also from um, uh, various numerics groups that I've already mentioned during the talk. And thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Um, okay, so we had, um, uh, we had one question. Um, from Ekaterina Persky. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, how did you obtain such a nice density wave in a system with a tilt? Did you add the tilt afterwards? Uh, yes, so, so you start by preparing the charge density wave just as before, and then you suddenly switch on the, the tilt onto the system, and you switch off this modulation potential and let the, the system move. Um, so, uh, and then we have from Jinglong Yu, um, when considering infinite temperature, is the single band description reasonable for this case? Uh, I mean, this is infinite temperature within the single band, which is a well-defined thing you can talk about still. Um, yeah. Okay, um, Aruku Senu asked, is it possible for the quantum gas microscope to attack uh, the coherent transport effect? Not sure what so, I'm not sure exactly what he means by. Would it be possible to to hear the the, the person who asked the question? Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah, maybe so we, either we can. Yeah. Is is sort of coherent? I wouldn't say we're in an incoherent transport regime uh, in the strange metal. Okay, so so okay. Here's my interpretation of what can ask matter people how they distinguish between coherent transport and incoherent transport. So. Um, you would call it, I think, the incoherent transport if we go all the way down to the small, to the largest k vector or the smallest wavelength, um, 
and that would be like every other a charge density weight with every other site. And then if you um, you do not see oscillations there, you would call it incoherent. But as you saw, when we go to short wavelengths, we're we're still seeing sound. So basically, if you don't have sound, then I would call that incoherent. And we've tried that. We 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 always were in a coherent transport regime by that definition. Um, let's see. Maybe we can uh, come back to Aruk in a minute once uh, we figure so, out how to turn. I think oh. Aruk actually has permission to talk. Um, oh, okay. If you want to yeah. say whether your question has been answered, you can unmute yourself and to talk. Yeah. Uh, can you hear? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Oh yeah. So I will need to ask you the like. I mean, coherent as a interference effect, right? This uh, this. Uh, hydrodynamic effect is uh, from the equation of the not amplitude of the wave function, but the uh, intensity or uh, of the wave function, uh, like square of the wave function. And I want there are a lot of coherent, like amplitude interference effect. Uh, transportation effect, and I wanted to, to know, like, uh, is it, uh, are there any, so this kind of proposal already for interference effect of transportation? Uh, does it make sense? I yeah, sorry, I'm not understanding the question fully, but like I said, I, I think we are in a coherent transport regime uh, just because we're seeing this, this sound, but I, I, maybe we can discuss this by email or something. Um, um, okay, Hilary Hurst asked, uh, can you use these methods to look at short time dynamics too, such as studying ballistic to diffusive transport crossover or similar? Yeah, I mean, the we, we can probe the system at time scales that are uh, very short compared to the microscopic time scale, the tunneling, um, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Like you saw here, we were in the, in the heat transport experiment, we were probing it over like orders of magnitude and can distinguish the various kinds of dynamics that are happening. I mean, there's even at shorter time scales than the one I showed, there's like block oscillations going on and things like that. And you can, you can see, sort of see the system go from block oscillations to, to this more incoherent regime and so on. Um, let's see. So I think uh, Bill Phillips has a question, and I feel like we can let him ask the question himself in sort of the <laughs> tradition of most AMO conferences. So, <laughs> well, I was wondering. I was trying to get an, uh, a feeling for how big the tilt is. So if I parameterize the tilt in terms of how much the energy changes per lattice site, how big is that compared to, say, the initial size of the depth of the the lattice that's used to produce the density modulation in the first place? And is that an important number at all? Well, I think the relevant number is the is the tunneling, and that's what I've been. Oops, uh, did I close this? Did you still see my? So, yeah, I mean this. Uh, um, this graph here, the the thing we're using it to, to parameterize is the is the tunneling, and that's even a much smaller energy scale than the. Than the depth of the lattice, right? And, um, yeah, so I think that's the relevant. Like basically, in a single particle picture, once you bias by something large compared to t, you would expect things to kind of slow down significantly. So that's the unit we've been using for for this uh, data. Okay, but if if you were to put it into um, uh, the units that I was wondering, do you know what that is offhand? Um, not off the top of my head, no. Okay. It will be a much smaller than, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, Shimon, you're actually muted right now. Oh, thank you, Adam. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry, we'll take maybe two more questions and then we'll call it a day. So, um, and now you can hear me. So, uh, William Morong asks, can you learn something about the bad metal behavior from the thermal conductivity? Doesn't this also somehow reflect the breakdown of quasi-particles similar to charge transport? Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done any like straightforward 
thermal transport measurements. Uh, like th this thermal trans this thermal diffusivity you're measuring is like at, at a single temperature, right? It's at temperature equals infinity essentially. Um, yeah, but I mean, you can imagine doing experiments where you just heat up like a chunk of the gas and um, and, and just seeing the transport in, in response to that. Uh, we, we haven't done those sorts of experiments. Um, yeah. Um, okay, and then there are a couple more questions, but maybe so one more comment about this. Like yep. uh, in, I think in um, in Stanford, uh, the group of uh, Kapitulnik is, is is studying the stream middle with heat transport uh, precisely in a, in a condensed matter system. That's how they see strange metals. Um, okay, so I think we'll we'll ask one more question, and then we'll call it. And and if if we didn't get to your question, then please feel free to um, you know. Uh, email Wasim or well, I'm I'm volunteering for you, Wasim. But feel feel free to reach out to to Wasim if you have um, further questions. So uh, Harry Zhu asked for these fractonic considerations. Are there any differences between a boson fermion spin model? No, I, I mean the the way you would study the system was like typically the way they studied in these papers is not even a quantum picture. You, it's just mostly a connectivity of the Hamiltonian. So uh, like a, if you're familiar with classical like circuits, that's typically how they would, you would study them. And it doesn't, the statistics really doesn't matter for any of this. Okay, great. So I think we'll thank Wasim again. I don't know if we found a way to unmute everyone, but you can imagine that everyone's applauding for you. Um, and um, and then uh, in the tradition now, I guess of this talk, I'll, I'll announce how many people we had watching. So at its peak, we had about 215 uh participants including both the um zoom webinar and the um the youtube stream um but i'll add that from our last uh seminar we had a number of views we've had many views on the youtube recording since then so if you count all the totals from last time we've had over i think a thousand views although i don't know that everyone's watching the talk the whole way through every time but so i think there'll be a number of people also watching um this going forwards and so we look forward to seeing all of you Next week, um, the I think actually our, our uh, founder, the person who instituted this whole series, uh, Adam Kaufman, is going to be giving the talk next week. And um, uh, yeah, you can find all the information on the website and everything. And if you haven't signed up, please sign up for the email list. Thanks a lot.